offer a complete suite of products and services to support organizations through the entire employee life cycle, including recruiting, HR, payroll, benefits administration, time and attendance, and compliance assistance. We support our clients with cutting edge technical solutions, as well as proactive, reliable service and a deep HR and payroll expertise. At NP, we are wired for HR and help our clients succeed by aligning their people strategy with their business goals. I'm excited to introduce your presenter for today's program, Jen Saray. Jen is a SHRM certified senior HR partner at NP. She received her BA from Clark University and previously managed HR for the Northeast Division of a national nonprofit organization. Jen loves building relationships with her clients while helping them meet their HR goals. In just a few housekeeping issues before we get started here today. If you would like to submit a question during the program, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. Along with that, we will be sending out the recording of the webinar later today along with the slides. So with all of that, I'm gonna hand the mic off to Jen. Thank you so much. And thanks everyone for uh, being here today. Before we get started, I do just want to share this legal disclaimer with you, letting you know that this training is intended for educational and informational purposes only. So, you know, I hope you learn a lot today, but please know I'm not an attorney. So the information I share today shouldn't be construed as legal advice. And then um, the information in the presentation is updated as of, that should say September 29th, 2022. My apologies for the typo. So be sure to check with federal, state, and local jurisdictions for the most up-to-date guidance, especially if you're watching a recording um, at a future time. So today we're going to dive into a couple different top topics here. We're going to start off by talking about, you know, why do you need an employee handbook? And then I'll talk about um, some of the different items that you want to make sure you're including in your handbook, specifically talk about some policies to update for 2022. Um, I will touch a little bit on COVID-19 handbook addendums, and then I'll also cover the top 10 handbook mistakes to avoid. So first off, um, you know, why, why would you want to bother having an employee handbook? It sounds like a lot of work, right? Well, the handbook gives employees um, a detailed overview of the policies that are specific to your company, along with other key guidelines and benefits. And in a nutshell, it sets clear expectations for your employees, while also stating your legal obligations and defining employee rights. An employee handbook can help protect your business to get employment, uh, employee lawsuits and claims, such as wrongful termination, harassment, and discrimination. And the handbook is also a crucial introduction to your business for new hires. It provides insights to your company's mission, values, and culture. And in addition to communicating expectations, the employee handbook can help with compliance with state and federal laws. It can be a go-to resource for employees and showca showcase those company benefits. Most importantly, it's a tool for managers to deal with workplace issues and ensure consistency and fairness in applying workplace rules. And if you ever had to defend the company in an employment situation, having a handbook that you have given, reviewed, and the employee has acknowledged can be a key defense should the employee claim you didn't convey the standards of conduct and then the employee was terminated for violating that policy. So a company looks more buttoned up and professional in a court of law and more professional to the employee. And we all know it's hard to attract and retain employees currently. And how you present yourself as an employer is key. So when it comes to handbooks, it's important to remember that one size does not fit all. It may be tempting to use a handbook from a company that you've worked for in the past, or maybe a handbook from a friend's company, but you really wanna make sure the handbook reflects the needs of your current company. You'll want to consider company size, number of employees. Uh, many employment laws kick in when you reach a certain headcount. And you want to make sure your handbook isn't forcing your hand to comply with employment laws that you don't necessarily need to yet. Uh, for example, if you borrow a handbook from a friend who owns a company with 75 employees, that handbook is most likely going to have a policy for the Federal Family and Medical Leave Act. And if your business has less than 50 employees, you aren't considered a covered employer under the FMLA. And you wouldn't need to follow that policy. However, if it's in your handbook, you could be on the hook for providing unpaid leave to your employees. You'll also wanna consider company locations and the states where you operate. 
Employment laws are based on where the employee is performing the majority of their work. So that means in addition to any brick and mortar physical locations, you also wanna think about any states where you have remote employees working from home. So for example, if you have offices in Massachusetts and Rhode Island, and remote employees working from home in California and Pennsylvania, you wanna make sure you have handbook addendums for all four states. Also keep in mind, this includes setting up things like payroll taxes, unemployment, and workers' compensation in the states where you have employees working. And your industry may have specific laws to follow, for instance, transportation with DOT laws. And you'll also wanna think about your industry, whether or not your company is a government contractor, whether or not your company is unionized and have those considerations in your handbook. And you also wanna think about the workforce in terms of diversity uh, and various employment categories and uh, telecommuting and remote workers. You know, this has um, become much bigger for us in the past couple of years, um, literacy, language and disability. So to touch on diversity, um, you know, it, it's key to all of your, uh, to all organizations. And you may have a DEI policy um, for employment categories, think about, you know, do you have full-time, part-time, seasonal, maybe you have interns. Um, if you have employees working from home or maybe a hybrid schedule, you want to have a policy on, you know, what's going to be expected in that type of arrangement, what you cover as an employer. Um, if your population has, uh, employee population has multiple languages, consider putting, you know, you could consider putting the handbook into multiple languages. Um, the handbook build builder that we actually use um, for MPHR, we can translate into Spanish, which has um, been helpful for several clients. And then uh, disability policies, important to convey, employees will not be discriminated um, on a, a based on a disability or uh, employment status, uh, such as race, religion, gender, et cetera. And some, Tips regarding do's and don'ts for your handbook. Uh, so it's important to put your policies in writing, but sometimes too much detail you know, isn't needed. So for example, when it comes to policies regarding your benefits, we usually suggest putting you know, a high level summary, letting your employees know which benefits you offer, but then just refer back to the summary plan documents for details since those items are sub subject to change, right? So um, if you, you know, are changing your, um, who, you, who you go through for your health insurance, you don't have to change it every time if you're kind of switching from, from one provider to the next or the you know, exact amounts that you're covering. So best to keep that high level. And then make sure you're applying policies consistently. And this is really key. If you let some employees use sick time as vacation time and not others, you know, that can be a big problem. And if you don't follow what's in the handbook, your, you know, your practice really becomes your policy. And then it's hard to enforce any of the policies in your handbook. An employee or their attorney could argue, you know, how did the employee know that they should or shouldn't do something in a policy if the company doesn't follow the other policies in the handbook? So make sure uh, you're also communicating your handbook policies to all employees. And if you're a client of MP, you can make the handbook available to employees in iSolve for electronic acknowledgement. And it's always a good idea to communicate changes made to policies as they occur, you know, especially when new laws come into effect in particular states. It's very easy to do when you have an electronic handbook as opposed to having to reprint and destroy outdated copies that may be floating around. Um, and then you also wanna make sure the handbook is easy to read. Uh, but remember, there are reasons that policies are written as they are, especially when it comes to employment laws. We don't want to treat a handbook like an operations manual. Uh, those should be separate from the handbook. For instance, you know, a checklist of what an employee needs to do at the opening of a shift and the end of a shift, that's operational. Uh, you know, in, this, in the handbook, under the standards of conduct, you would state that employees need to follow guidance for management or procedures set forth in their role. So things like that. So did want to touch on, on kind of the, some important language that you, you do want to have in the handbook and some language that you really want to make sure you don't have. So you want to make sure that your handbook includes at-will employment language, and it doesn't include any language that could make an employee think that their employment is contractual. At-will employment means that there's no employment contract, and the employee or the employer is free to end the employment relationship at any time for any reason. And you wanna make sure you avoid using terms that imply job security or job guarantees, such as um, saying, you know, putting language in the handbook that says successfully passing your probationary period or, you know, long rewarding career with the company. And you also wanna avoid using the term permanent employment. 
Um, if you also uh, employ temporary uh, employees, and you're trying to differentiate between, you know, someone who's temporary and someone who isn't, it's best to say a regular full-time employee or a regular part-time employee to indicate that, um, you know, an employee who's regularly scheduled to work. It's also a good idea to explicitly state that the handbook is not a contract and you retain the right to revise the employment relationship. The, uh, the handbook is a policy guide that can be revised at any time and that you will communicate any changes as they arise. Okay, now let's talk about um, some things to include in your handbook. Uh, so you can really use the handbook as an opportunity to tell your company's story. A handbook can create a first impression for a new hire, letting them know what you're doing as a company through your culture, mission, and goals. And it's a best practice to include an employee relations policy. Uh, these are sometimes also called an open door policy. Um, you, you want employees to feel comfortable speaking to their managers or leaders, you know, all the time, but especially if they have concerns or issues. We want to encourage open communication um, to keep issues from becoming ticking time bombs so we can address them sooner rather than later. And it's also important to be mindful of gender neutral language throughout the handbook. Subtle changes like this can really make a huge difference in making employees feel comfortable and accepted. All right, now let's get into some compliance policies. So these are the required policy, policies that we really don't want to modify since they aren't specific to your company. Uh, and we'll start with the EEO statement. EEO stands for Equal Employment Opportunity Statement and Discrimination and Harassment Policies. So they're big ones and they can get uh, state specific. So I'll talk more about this in a couple slides. Um, Another one is a drug-free workplace, uh, including drug testing and substance abuse. So this includes language regarding the use of medical marijuana or prescription medicine. It's good to have a policy that states employees can't be impaired at work, even if they are legally allowed to use these drugs outside of work. And you wanna have policies around compensation, including wage and hour information, um, such as state laws regarding overtime and how often employees need to be paid. You'll want to include that, you know, as an employer, you are required to include paycheck deductions, such as state disability insurance, just to let employees know about that up front. And then it's also important to include policies regarding empl uh, employee safety. And you may be able to keep this general, uh, but you want the employees to report any safety issues or concerns, or make sure they know what to do, what to do, who to reach out to if they get hurt at work. Uh, and if you're in a safety sensitive in industry that uses, you know, a lot of heavy machinery or other potentially hazardous equipment, you may need a very detailed safety manual that would be separate from the handbook. Okay, now let's talk about workplace policies to include that are going to be uh, a little more specific to your company. So. First off is um, always a good idea to have a policy about your attendance uh, requirements. And you wanna be specific about how employees are to communicate if they're gonna be out or late and also include a no call, no show statement. This lets the employee know if they don't report to work for three consecutive days without you know, calling in, informing you, this will be considered a voluntary resignation of their position. You know, meaning this is not a termination on the company's part, but this is the employee quitting, resigning their job. Okay, so I think that's an important uh, differentiation. And in this day and age with technology making it much easier to communicate, we have seen some companies shorten the no call, no show policy to two days. And so it is, you know, more reasonable to do that now. And then standards of conduct and performance, it's very important to include this, you know, items such as you no know, stealing or falsification of time cards following safety protocols and not violating things like the harassment or workplace violence and drug and alcohol policy. You wanna make sure that's all pretty clear in the handbook. Um, and then talking about kind of technology, um, you wanna have a policy that covers use of the company's computers and other equipment, whether you wanna you know, be specific, specify that they should be used for work purposes only, um, and you're letting employees know they shouldn't assume anything they do on their work computer is private, even if it's password protected. You also want to let employees know you won't tolerate harassment of employees, clients, or customers via electronic technology. This includes through social media. 
So this could be an issue, issue you know, if it creeps into the workplace, even if it's happening outside of work time. And you can take action if it's impacting the workplace. And you wanna make sure you're including uh, benefits information I kind of alluded to before, but also um, you know, vacation time, sick time, holiday policies. Um, and for anything with a summary plan document, you keep it high level for those medical dental vision plans. And you can have a policy about handling confidential or sensitive information that's applicable for all employees. And that's definitely a good practice. But keep, keep in mind, if you need a non-disclosure agreement for certain roles, that would be something that you would want to have outside of the handbook that they should sign in addition to just a general policy. And then it's also a good practice to have an employee complaint process. I mentioned this earlier, but, you know, open door policy um, is great. And then within each policy, let employees know who they can talk to if they have any questions. Um, you know, ideally, employees have a good relationship with their managers and will speak with them if there's an issue or a question. But you want to make sure you train your manager so they know, you know, when a concern should be escalated, such as an allegation of harassment that really does need to be brought to the attention of HR or senior management. Oh, okay. Sorry, slight typo there. I should say policy updates for 2022. So we're going to get into some um, updates for this year. So we're going to talk about um, equal employment opportunity, workplace harassment, paid family and medical leave, paid sick leave, equal pay and wage discrimination, and substance use and testing. And as I mentioned previously, it's important to keep in mind that employment policies are tied to where your employees perform the majority of their work. So if your business is located in New Hampshire and over the past year you hired one remote employee in California, you'll need to make sure your handbook includes relevant policies for that one employee. So with that in mind, let's begin with equal employment opportunity. Okay, so at the federal level, applicants, employees, and former employees are protected from employment discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, including pregnancy, sexual orientation, or gender identity, national origin, age, if it's 40 or older, disability and genetic information, including family medical history. So applicants, employees, and former employees are also protected from retaliation for filing a charge or complaint of discrimination, participating in a discrimination investigation or lawsuit, or opposing discrimination. And this chart shows the claims filed by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission for fiscal year 2021. You'll notice that the percent totals are over 100, and that's because claims are often filed under multiple categories. So the 2021 data shows that retaliation continued to be the most frequently filed charge with the agency, followed by disability, race, and sex. And many states have expanded protected classes, including marital status, AIDS, HIV status, observance of the Sabbath, political activities, arrest record, or use of a service dog. So you do wanna make sure that you're including the equal, uh, equal employment and anti-harassment policies for each state where you have employees and that they are up to date, including all of those relevant protected classes. So, uh, while this isn't necessarily in your handbook, you know, I did think it would be worth mentioning that in addition to EEO and anti-harassment policies, that seven states and the District of Columbia require training on the prevention of harassment in the workplace. And each state is slightly different when it comes to who is considered a covered employer, covered employer and employee and what must be included in the content of the training. So for example, California employer, employers with five or more employees anywhere, not just in California, must provide one or two hours of interactive training to their California-based employees, depending on whether the employee has supervisory responsibilities. And Colorado, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Vermont encourage training, but it isn't currently required. Training is considered a best practice when not required. It's always a good idea to make sure your employees know your harassment policy and how to report incidents of harassment. When employees feel that their employer takes complaints seriously, they're more likely to come forward before a situation gets out of control or before filing a complaint with the EEOC or state agencies. So now talking about um, some leave laws, the Federal Family and Medical Leave Act, FMLA, requires eligible employers to provide unpaid family leave. 
So however, unlike nearly all other industrialized na uh, nations, the US does not have a nas uh, any national standards on paid family or sick leave. And, and in the absence of a federal policy, states have enacted their own paid family leaves. So paid family leave laws provide parents and caregivers time off to address a serious health condition, including pe pregnancy, care for a family member with a serious health condition, address family circumstances arising from a military service member's uh, deployment, or care for a newborn, newly adopted child, or newly placed foster child. So currently 11 states and Washington, D.C. have passed family and medical leave laws that are paid or can be paid through a state-run disability program. Colorado, New Hampshire, and Oregon have adopted paid leave programs that will begin in 2023, and employees in Maryland and Delaware will be eligible to take paid leave beginning in 2025 and 2026, respectively. So in addition to making sure you know if the states, state or states you operate in have state-mandated paid family uh, and or medical leave laws, you also want to determine how they interact with federal leave laws, as well as your own company leave benefits. And depending on an employee's eligibility, these, these leaves may run concurrently, so at, at the same time, and you want to make sure employees are aware so they don't think they can take FMLA after their state leave has expired, right? We want to avoid situations where employees are stacking, stacking leave, taking 12 weeks of um, state you know, paid family leave, and then maybe wanting another 12 weeks of unpaid FMLA. Okay, so let's talk about paid sick leave laws. Paid sick leave laws allow for workers to take time to attend to doctor's appointments, pick up sick children from school, deal with issues related to sexual or domestic violence, accommodate public health emergencies, and businesses or school closures, all with job protected time they accrue. New Mexico is the latest state to enact paid sick leave, and the law went into effect on July 1st, 2022. In addition to the 16 states that offer paid sick time, there are other states that have city and or county paid sick leave laws that you should be aware of as well. And I have that listed on the chart on the right. So ultimately you wanna make sure that your handbook accurately ref reflects the paid sick leave laws that apply to your workforce. And as it was mentioned earlier, so you're not frantically trying to jot down any, any of this information on the charts. Um, everyone who registered for the webinar will receive a copy of the slide. So please don't feel like you have to um, write down all of these uh, states and localities right now. Okay, so now let's talk about equal pay and wage discrimination. So we now have equal pay laws in all 50 states. Mississippi was actually the last state to pass an equal pay law that was in April of 2022. So these equal pay laws include provisions on pay equity, pay history and or pay transparency. And wage transparency laws prohibit employers from disallowing pay disclosures in the workplace and from retaliating against employees who discuss their pay with others. So in theory, when, an, when employee compensation data is shared, collected and reported freely, it promotes fair pay both within companies and across industries. And there are 17 states that go a step further, making salary history bans applicable to both public and private employers. So it's important for you to look at your handbook to ensure none of your policies violate these equal pay laws. For example, you'd wanna make sure you uh, remove any policies that uh, prevent employees from discussing their pay information. Okay, so now a word on substance use and testing. As of today, there are 19 states, two territories, and Washington, D.C. have enacted legislation to regulate recreational use of marijuana while it remains legal for medicinal purposes in 37 states. So these numbers seem to always be changing um, every year. Um, and many of these state level uh, laws include anti-retaliation provisions, which prohibit employers from using drug testing or the threat of a drug test to discourage workers from reporting on the job injuries and illnesses. And specifically, OSHA said employers shouldn't administer blanket post-accident drug tests in situations when drug use likely did not cause an injury. 
Drug testing that is conducted to evaluate the root cause of a workplace incident that harmed or could have harmed employees is allowed if the employer tests all workers who could have contributed to the incident rather than just the employee who reported the injuries. And you'll wanna make sure your drug and alcohol policy doesn't contradict medicinal or recreational marijuana laws in the states where you operate. Okay, so if you have a COVID-19, if you have COVID-19 policies in your handbook, now's a good time to make sure that they're still up to date and remove any policies that are no longer in effect. And because policies related to the pandemic are constantly evolving, we do recommend employers keep these policies in a separate addendum to the handbook. So first let's talk about leave policies. All of the federal level paid COVID sick and family leave laws have sunsetted, but many states as well as counties and localities enacted their own temporary paid sick and family leave laws, as well as vaccination leaves. So it's a good idea to check that what you're, uh, when you're making updates, you know, where needed, depending on where your employees are located. And we've seen how many businesses have thrived in a remote work environment, and many are now considering keeping employees remote or creating hybrid work environments. And if there's one silver lining from this uh, pandemic, it has certainly opened up new opportunities for growth for businesses that are able to hire remotely, but had not previously tapped into these new talent pools. With so many businesses continuing to add remote workers, it's important to revisit these remote work policies and see how they might be adapted for ongoing use. If you're going to hire out-of-state remote employees, you should add language to your policy indicating remote workers must notify you if they relocate to a different state, um, because really employers are ultimately res uh, responsible for ensuring that the correct payroll taxes and employment laws are applied to their employees based on where the majority of the work is performed. Um, so, you know, if you have an employee who you hired um, in Texas and, um, you know, you're, you're based out of Massachusetts, you don't see that employee every day, um, and they move to Arizona, it's really important that you know that and, and make sure employees know they, they have to tell you because, um, yeah, that could, you could see how that could potentially happen without you knowing since you're not seeing them on a day-to-day -day basis. And if you're moving to a hybrid environment, you may also want to create a policy to define any parameters around who can work from home and set expectations for remote work. And this is also where you can include any relevant vaccination policies and guidelines. And this might all feel like old news, but states like New York have extended their vaccination leave laws until December 31st, 2023. So it's not going away just yet. Okay. So now before you log off, because you're so excited to start updating your handbook and your policies, I wanna share some common mistakes that we see time and time again when it comes to handbooks. So hopefully you can avoid them. Okay. So first off, policies not matching your practice. This is so important, something I tell every client when we're starting to work on a handbook together. Policies are pretty useless when they only exist on paper and aren't reflected in the way that you do business and manage employees. And this can actually harm you too. If you're trying to hold an employee accountable to a particular policy, but it turns out that you're not practicing many of the policies in your handbook, it's gonna be pretty hard to justify why you're trying to hold employee accountable to that policy. Okay, so number two, is failing to train managers and supervisors. So if your managers and supervisors haven't received training on your policies, it's gonna be really hard for them to put your policies into practice and to manage to those policies. So good idea, um, you know, if, if those managers aren't involved in the handbook, you know, update process, you know, maybe set a time, a meeting to kind of go over it with them and make sure they understand how you want them to be, um, you know, following out these policies with employees. Next is restrictive social media policies. So while it's a good idea to have a set of guidelines surrounding employee social media use, employers do need to be careful that they aren't infringing on employee rights. Um, even employers without any union employees need to abide by the national labor relations rules when it comes to allowing employees to exercise their right to speak about working conditions. So, uh, you know, when I'm working on 
handbooks with clients, I do have some particular language that I, I like to include um, that makes it really clear um, that we're, we're not doing that. We're not infringing on the rights. It's always a good idea. Um, and next is, the next mistake is to not revise the handbook regularly. So it may be tempting to just do a handbook once and move on, but a handbook should be a living document because we all know things change pretty rapidly from new sick and family leave laws to your own internal practices. And it, a best practice is to review your handbook annually to ensure it's up to date. You can make this less cumbersome for yourself and your employees by using electronic distribution and acknowledgement forms, um, such as, um, you know, how when I'm working with the clients, we may help them to make their handbook available through their employee self-service portal and iSolved, so it can be easily redistributed whenever changes are made. And we can make sure that the older version of the handbook is still there for record retention purposes, but it's not going to be visible to the employees anymore. Next, we have failing to include required policies. So while policies are not necessarily required in a handbook, there are certain notices that must be given to employees upon hire. For example, in Massachusetts, all new hires need to receive the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act notice and a notice about earned sick time. So we strongly recommend you include these notices as handbook policies rather than having to remember to distribute them as a standalone notice to your employees. And next is that one size fits all approach that I kind of alluded to earlier. You know, some businesses may need different handbooks for different populations of employees. Uh, for example, one for faculty and one for administrative staff at a private school or different handbooks for exempt and non-exempt employees. And I have some multi-state employers that have a separate handbook for each state where they operate, uh, which you may want to consider if several state addendums, several state addendums will make your handbook very long. Or if you have some employees in a state with paid sick and family leave and employees in a state without these benefits. And the next uh, mistake to avoid is overly detailed discipline procedures. So, you know, it's great to let employees know that you'll attempt to follow a progressive disciplinary process, but you wanna make sure that you aren't getting so detailed that you're, you know, getting yourself kind of stuck following a particular set of steps rather than allowing you to use your discretion and handle incidents on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I once worked with a company that had a very rigid progressive disciplinary, uh, disciplinary policy that required a first, second, and then final written warning. And it caused some problems when the circumstances of the situation warranted skipping to a final written warning. Um, so you wanna make sure that you're allowing yourself that flexibility to apply the level of discipline that matches the severity of the unwanted behavior or policy violation. Okay, and the next mistake to avoid is omitting uh, the at-will statement and disclaimers. So um, sometimes, uh, you know, the person working on a handbook isn't always the final decision maker, um, and that sometimes that decision maker doesn't um, doesn't understand the importance of these sections of the handbook, and they want to omit them in an attempt to make the handbook shorter or to remove any uh, legalese. But as I mentioned earlier, you wanna make sure it's clear that your handbook isn't a contract and that employment is at will and make it clear to employees exactly what that means. So it's an important one. And the next mistake to avoid is using a boilerplate handbook. So I've worked with a lot of clients who adopted a handbook from a previous employer or got a handbook from a friend who works at another company. And this could be a great starting off point but you wanna make sure you're customizing your handbook to reflect your company's policies and practices. And then lastly, number 10 is failing to distribute the handbook. And I've seen this happen a lot. Um, you know, you, you spend a lot of time and effort working to create a custom handbook and it's reached that point in time when it needs to get approved by someone who hasn't been involved in the process, but then it, uh, you know, it never gets formally approved. And it's really important to get buy-in from leadership so they know the importance of getting the handbook out to employees. You know, you can't expect employees to follow your policies when they've never received a copy of the handbook. So that's really important. Okay, so we had a, a bit of a quicker um, uh, presentation today and I'm seeing uh, chats are kind of popping up in two different places. So I'm gonna try to um, 
look at both of them. So let me just get them over on my screen here. Okay. So a couple good questions here. Um, how often should the handbook or changes be acknowledged by employees? So um, it's a good practice to have the handbook acknowledged at least annually. Um, you know, and any times in between that, I think it's going to depend on how many policies you're changing. So I had a conversation with a client recently. They were asking, well, what do we do? You know, what if we have some mid-year policy changes? So I think you have a couple options. If these mid-year policy changes are kind of happening smack dab in, in the middle of the year, um, you know, it might be a good idea just to, to update the handbook and, and put it up there and have employees re-acknowledge it. But if it's, there's some new policies that are happening, you know, a couple months before the new handbook is going to be rolled out, I think it's fine to have, to kind of issue these to employees as a standalone Word document and ask them to sign off. And then you just include that new policy with the next handbook rollout that's coming up pretty soon. So, um, and that's another great way I think to utilize um, iSolved is um, that, you know, in addition to rolling out the handbook electronically and having employees sign off on it, you can also do that, um, have a, a one-off document, for example, um, you know, a harassment policy or any other policy that you would have as a standalone document document, we can also put that in um, employee messages and you can have employees acknowledge that individual message. So if you wanted to roll out a policy before the big handbook rollout, that's a good way to do it. Um, let's see. Another question here. So we work with MP and have I solved. It's putting the handbook in I solved and asking folks to acknowledge enough for notice. What if employees don't go into I solved? So that's a great question. So um, you know, you can use you can use um, an electronic notice instead of a paper notice, but it, you definitely want to think about your employees and what's going to work best for that population, right? So I have some clients that have um, employees who uh, maybe they're not very proficient with te with technology, or maybe they're on the road a lot and it's really struggled to get them involved. So you'd really want to make sure you trained them on how to use the system. Uh, you know, in this day and age most everybody has a smartphone. So we would think that most people will be able to use these systems. Um, but you do, you do want to make sure that you're, you're giving folks some training, uh, because that's also, you know, if they're logging into their employee self-service portal, that's also how they're getting, you know, their pay stubs, how they can, you know, make updates to their address. So it's really important to make sure that they know how to use the system. Um, and then you can use that going forward. Okay. And someone asked, will the slide deck be sent out to attendees after the webinar? Yes, it will be. Um, someone had a question, can we include PTO time as paid sick leave? So um, usually you can, so that's probably gonna depend on the, the state that you're located in. Um, so typically you just have to make sure that your PTO time, your PTO policy is as generous as the um, sick leave. If there's a, a, man, a mandatory sick leave in the state where you're located, the PTO policy just needs to be as generous as that. So for example, um, in Massachusetts, employees need to get 40 hours of sick time every year. And um, if it's an accrual policy, you have to let them carry over um, up to 40 hours of unused time. So if you had a PTO policy that allowed that follow those same rules, that would be absolutely fine. Okay. Okay, someone had a question, can you incorporate contractor information into a handbook or should that be kept separate? We have contractors and employees. So um, definitely I would not include contractor information in a handbook. It's really important to make sure that um, you're not treating contractors like employees. Um, I'm assuming you kind of mean like a, a 1099 worker. So since these are, are not W-2 employees and they're really, um, uh, you know, working for you based on a contract, kind of um, providing a set of deliverables, you wouldn't want to have any, um, any kind of blurring of lines or anything that may indicate that they're improperly classified. So definitely would not want to have any contractor information in a handbook. Okay. Let's see what else. Um, yes, this presentation is being recorded in addition to receiving the um, a copy of the PowerPoint slides, you also receive a, um, a recording of the actual presentation. All right, so these are some good questions. Let me just scroll through and see if I can find any more that might be applicable to everyone. Uh, 
Um, this is a great question about no call, no show policy. So someone asked, should the employer reach out to employees who have not reported to work on the third day before we accept the no call, no show as resignation? So yes, it is a best practice. You know, if an employee you know, one day they, you know, they don't come in, um, two days you're, that you are reaching out and kind of checking in with them to see what's going on. Um, you know, who knows, uh, hopefully there's not been an emergency and there, you know, something, something terrible has happened, but it, it is a good idea to reach out and, and try to connect with that person to see what's going on. And then of course, if, you know, they really, if they are no call, no show for three days, but then, you know, a couple of days later, you find out they're in a coma in a hospital. I mean, of course, you're going to overturn that no call, no show. They, you know, there was no fault of their own. They, they were not able to, to reach out to you in that situation. But yes, it is a best practice to try to reach out to that employee um, before they get to that third um, no call, no show day. Okay, so I think that we got all of the questions that were kind of applicable to everybody. So thank you so much for attending today, and I hope you all learned something. Thank you so much, Jen. To learn more about how about MP's HR compliance services for employee handbooks and more, schedule a quick consult with one of our solution specialists. I've dropped a link in the chat that will be connect you with an MP team member. You can also visit our website or call 774-266-6497 for more information. Be sure to join us next week on the same day and time for our webinar on semi-annual HR legislative updates. Visit our website to register and to see the full calendar of upcoming events and available resources. We will be sending out the recording of today's webinar with the presentation slides this afternoon. Thanks for joining us and have a terrific day.